So, hello, everyone. Uh, so, this is what we're going to talk about. We were to, we're going to talk about uh, mixing these three languages, C, Rust, and Go. Uh, this is the URL to the repository where you can find the working code for the stuff that I'm going to talk about. You can download it later or not. Um, so, yeah, I did not introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrea. I work for Red Hat uh, in virtualization. And we have a lot of C code like a lot of C code. And so we've been thinking maybe we don't want to have that much C code, so let's, let's play with other stuff. Um, so the goal that we have in mind for, for this experiment um, is to take uh, some existing C library and rewrite the logic in Rust or Go. And so basically what we have is this, right? We have the library code, uh, all the logic is written in C, and we have some client code which is using that directly, and then we have bindings for Rust and for Go, and we have client code in those languages as well. Um, what we want to have instead is this, where the library code is implemented in Rust, and the client code is calling, the Rust client code is calling that code directly, that we have bindings for C and for Go. Or alternatively, uh, we want to have the core library written in Go, and we have binding for C and Rust. So, the complexity does not really increase because we have the same number of bindings, uh, but ideally we would be able to move uh, most of our logic of the complex stuff to uh, uh, different language than C. So what we're going to cover today is uh, some generic information about bindings this, that uh, apply to any language bindings, and then some stuff that is specific to the languages that we are dealing with. And I will show a lot of code snippets and those are mostly not valid code even in some points. I'm, I'm going to be skimming over uh, error, um, dealing, dealing with errors. Uh, uh, I'm going to do some stuff which is not even syntact syntactically accurate, but just for the purpose of uh, making it understandable quickly, uh, the code in the repository actually works. So trust me. And some disclaimers before we start is that uh, there are many choices that have been made during this um, during this project, and some of them could have been made differently. So this is just one way to to implement these things. You could pick a different way. Uh, I'm not that good at either Rust or Go. I I'm not. I would not call myself proficient in either of those languages. And some people would say the same about my C, but whatever. <laughs> um, and none of this has been used uh, in production. So maybe this seems to work and then you use it in production and it explodes. I don't know. I cannot tell you that. So we have this library that we are going to be using as an, as an example throughout the presentation. And uh, it's a file name builder. So you have uh, a base name for the file and then you can have multiple extensions. So for example, you could have foo uh, .rs .go .c, based on what language you're using. And you could decide that some file names are not acceptable, like foo.php. We don't want that, right? Um, so the way that this is, is going to be implemented is that you instantiate, instantiate the builder uh, by providing a, file, a base name and a function that can be used to accept or reject names. And then once you have built this object, you can use it multiple times uh, each time passing a, f a different file extension. And you will get some output, which is going to be either uh, a full file name if the input is acceptable, or an error if it's not. So we, we will see like an example of this in, uh, in action. Uh, in this case, we're using Go because it's less verbose. Our filter will uh, filter function will accept uh, rust.rs extension, Go extension, and C extension. Um, so we create a toy object, uh, this is our file name builder, uh, passing <coughs> foo as the base name <coughs> and the filter function, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and then we, we pass the go extension and we see whether there's any error and print the result. And in this case, go is one of the accepted extensions, so we print success, foo.go, perfect. We try again with the same code, but, but we use PHP as the extension, and this time the, this is not accepted by the filter function, so we get a failure instead. And the interface for, for this library in different languages, it's, it looks like this in C. So we have a, 
a bunch of possible errors. We have an opaque structure, a type def for the callback, you know, it's pretty standard stuff. Um, in Rust, it also looks kind of what you would expect. Um, and uh, in Go, also. So why? Why this specific interface? Right? Because it's, it's pretty silly. Um, and that's why the name of the object is toy, because it's not supposed to be something that useful. But it is useful for us because it covers a bunch of scenarios. It covers primitive types, objects, error reporting, and user-provided callbacks. All of this can be potentially problematic when dealing with uh, language bindings. So we have a single interface that covers all of this uh, in a couple of functions. Uh, one last uh, like uh, detour before we get into the, the thick of it. Uh, how we are doing error handling in C. Uh, so we use this API, which is heavily inspired by Jalib, Jalib's uh, G-error. And uh, the, if you're familiar with that API, basically each error contains three pieces of information. One is the domain, and the other one is the code, and the other one is the message. And the domain is basically mapping to the uh, native uh, error types of uh, the language that could be Go or Rust. Uh, the, uh, code maps to the specific uh, type of uh, the specific uh, error that happened, and the message is just for printing out. And so from C, it looks like this: we have uh, our structure, list of domains, uh, and we can get the domain, the code, or, or the message. Uh, you will notice that there is no <coughs> constructor for these values because we get them from the other languages. We don't need to construct them ourselves. And so any function that can fail uh, will take a double pointer to an error. And after the function has returned, you, you check whether um, this pointer is null. If it's null, then everything is fine. If it's not null, uh, then that means that an error occurred and we, were look, we can look at the details. And so in, in action, this looks like this. <coughs> uh, this is the definition. <coughs> and below, we check whether error is uh, null or not. And those of you with a keen sense of, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, <laughs> keen eye for this kind of details, will notice that this is basically the same code that you would write in, in Go and kind of what you would write in uh, Rust as well. So this maps really well to the semantics used by those languages for error reporting. Okay, so let's get into the various uh, implementations. Uh, so first, we start with the Rust implementation. This is our library code uh, implemented in Rust. And you just do the, the thing that you expect that you will need to do. There is nothing uh, particular that we need to do in this case. So we're just going to assume. It's, it's an left as an exercise to the reader. Um, for the Go part, which is, again, the library code written in Go, same thing. We don't really need to do anything. You just write the interface that you expect for a Go library. Now, things start getting more interesting where we start binding, uh, writing bindings. So oh, this notation that I did not explain, but uh, Rust arrow C means that I'm uh, talking about the Rust bindings for the C library, okay? So it's uh, client code is written in Rust, the library code is written in C. So it's this part, all right? So the first thing to note is that uh, you cannot just uh, use C symbols from uh, Rust. Uh, in order to be able to do so, you need to use this uh, tool, use BindGen, that will create the bindings and uh, allow you to do so. And in order to use the script, we need some plumbing. So we have in our cargo toml, we, we have the build dependency on BindGen, and then we have the, that build equals build RS, which tells cargo to use our build script. Uh, the build script is not particularly complex. Uh, we basically just have to instruct bo both um, um, both uh, Cargo uh, to where to look for the native library. So we give it the um, search path and the name of the library. Uh, and then we tell it where to write out the generated bindings, which is that bindings.rs file in some output directory. And this will automatically be executed when you run cargo build. Um, we have this wrapper header which just uh, drags in the 
main header file for the C library so that binds and can find uh, the definitions. And then in our Rust code, we can just take this bind generated file and just chomp it in. Everything goes into our source, uh, Rust source. And then we can decide to selectively expose just a subset of the symbols that uh, were uh, uh, generated by Vinezen to our Rust code. Um, so for objects uh, that we want, this is C object that we want to expose to Rust uh, client code, uh, we take a wrap and proxy approach. So that means that the Rust object contains a, a reference to the C object. And whenever you call a method on the Rust object, uh, what happens is that uh, the, um, the corresponding C method will be called on the underlying C object. So it looks like this. We have the, our toy error structure, uh, Rust structure that contains a pointer to the corresponding C structure. And we have this from function which basically just creates the wrapper. And when we, we drop the Rust objects, uh, what happens is that the C function that frees the memory is executed, so there is no memory leakage. And when we want to call any of the uh, functions, we just uh, unsafely call the corresponding uh, C function on the, on the C pointer, and then we convert uh, the value that we get back to a Rust value and return that one. Now this, this convert function, you're going to see it again, it's basically, let, let's pretend that that is doing magic. It's just converting, doing whatever you need to convert. It's, it's, it's not important. It's more verbose if you go to look at the actual code, but it's a shorthand. So th this is uh, pretty simple. Um, it gets more interesting when we get to uh, callbacks that are provided by the user. Uh, because in this situation, we, we receive from the user of the bindings a Rust callback. Uh, but what is going to ultimately execute this uh, callback is the C library. And when the C library execute the callback, it will pass uh, C types to it, uh, which our Rust callback cannot use. So we need to have some sort of type conversion. And in order to achieve that, we use a special wrapper that will do that for us. Um, so this is our uh, implementation of the constructor for our object. And you know we do all the usual conversion using our magic function. This is all fine. Uh, but when, <coughs> uh, if you notice, when we call the C function toy new, uh, what happens is that we pass our, this invoke callback as the filter. And the actual filter that we got from the user, we pass it as the data argument, which is kind of unexpected. Um, and the reason is that our invoke callback is this generic function that will take the C arguments, it, this is a C function, has a C, a C signature, C types, and it will convert them to Rust type, and then it will uh, obtain from, from C data, it will obtain the actual user callback, and then invoke it. So we have to do this kind of little dance, and uh, we, we kind of uh, sort of invert the arguments in a way. Um, and we can uh, do this because Rust is more uh, high level than C and so we don't actually need a data argument. If we need to move some data or caption some data, we can do it natively with Rust lambdas. Um, and so we use it to transport this other data. And uh, notice that the type conversion happens twice. Uh, each time the language boundary is crossed. So we take the, um, the data from, from Rust converted to C and then from C converted to Rust. Um, but that's how it works. Uh, then we talk about the um, Go bindings for the C library. So this is that square or rectangle action. So contrary to what happens with Rust, the C symbols are automatically available to Go. Um, there is no third party tool that we need to use, but we still need to provide the necessary flags and that happens with this specially formatted uh, C Go comments, which serve the same purpose as the uh, bind gen directives that we've seen before. Um, 
we deal with errors a bit differently here. Uh, instead of wrapping them, as we've done with uh, the Rust bindings, uh, we convert them into native uh, Go value. This is a bit of compromise because it requires us to do the conversion up front, uh, but it is much better because otherwise we would have to call the free function for every error. Uh, and in Go, this is not really suitable because of the way you usually write Go code. You just have a lot of errors that you need to check. So we could not do that. that. So we, we just, um, whenever we get a C error, we just grab the code and the message out of it and we convert them and we generate a, a Go structure that we return to Go code. <coughs> now we have additional challenges uh, when it comes to callbacks than we had in Rust. Uh, the basic idea is still the same, uh, but there is a problem. Uh, whereas first, uh, previously we could use just the data argument and use that to, paste, uh, to pass the this, uh, go callback around, uh, we have the problem that we cannot really access uh, Go object from C code. This is, this is not allowed. If you try to do it, the Go runtime will notice and uh, crash your software immediately. Um, and by objects, I mean also functions. So we need to find a way around this limitation. And our solution is lookup tables. So what we do is basically we create on the go side, we create a big array, and we, whenever we need to make an object available <coughs> from C code, we just put the object inside that array, and the index that it ends up in, it's its unique identifier, and it's sort of like a pointer, basically. Uh, it's just a number. We can pass it back and forth from C and go with no problems. And so our interface, which we only use internally, uh, looks like this. We have this add function that allows us to uh, store a new pointer to be accessible from C and we get its, uh, its index back. And then with that, inks, in back, uh, with that index, we can get back the original object. And once we don't need an object to be accessible from C anymore, we can remove it from the lookup table and it will be gone. So that takes care of that. It's weird, but it works. And now that we have found that way, uh, we can do basically the same thing that as we were doing with Rust. So if the code looks basically the same, right? The only difference is that uh, the base is just converted, but for the filter we, we use the callback add, which is giving us uh, the uh, Go reference. And then uh, in the same way, when we get to our wrapper function, the conversion between C and Go uh, this time means uh, extracting the original object back from this lookup table. Everything else just works the same. Um, okay, so now we're getting to the more interesting stuff, let's say, uh, which is calling uh, C, uh, sorry, calling Rust from C. So that would be this part of the graph. So what we do is we basically want to, uh, dealing with uh, dynamic linking in this context would be complicated, so we just want a static library. And so we tell, we tell Cargo, we instruct it just to build a static lib, and it would just give, you, give us a .a archive <coughs> that contains all our code. Um, however, there is not enough to make it work with auto tools. Uh, for auto tools to be willing to link against this library, uh, we need to provide a libtool manifest that contains the extra information, which are basically just the linker flags that we need. And so we, we fake it. Uh, we just take a template uh, libtool manifest and we replace the two values that we care about, which is the name of the library and the library flags that we need uh, to use when linking. This is our template, and um, it's very simple. Uh, I love the fact that libtool is very picky about the contents of the file, so the first two lines need to look pretty much exactly like this. Uh, you, you have to say that it's generated by libtool, even if it's not, otherwise it will not accept it. So there's the little comment, actually not, because I didn't want to lie too much. Uh, but once you have that, uh, you can take this uh, .la, um, 
library, and libtool will happily use it, and all the tools. Um, in this case, objects, since uh, Rust has pretty good native interoperability with C, the Rust objects can be exposed to C just as regular pointers, but we need to make sure we box them first, uh, which means that they need to be heap allocated. Uh, and then we can take these pointers and uh, use them back in Rust by just uh, casting them, um, which is very unsafe, of course, but we know what we're doing, so that's fine. Um, and so this is the simple version of it. We just build a um, Rust object, we box it, we get the row pointer into it, and we return it to C, uh, no problems. And when we want to use uh, this pointer uh, in Rust, we just uh, do this unsafe cast and we use it. So that, that is uh, pretty simple. Uh, the, for dealing with errors, we, we, do, we use the same uh, uh, in, in GR inspired interface that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and basically this implementation is identical to what we've seen when we were writing Go bindings for the C library, except it's the other way around. Uh, but it's not very remarkable. We're just calling to a wrapped object. And uh, for the callbacks, also, there is really nothing very different. It's just the same thing, but done the other way around. You know, convert data in the other direction. Nothing to it. Um, now, calling Go from C, this is, this is probably the one that uh, fewer people have attempted, I would say. If, certainly, if, if you go on the internet and look for information about it, that's the one that you will find the least information about. <coughs> And so one thing that is uh, tricky and weird is the way that you have to structure your project. Uh, usually the, all the other chunks of the project have been structured in nested directories and so forth. Uh, but when you're doing, um, when you're calling go from C, uh, C go will only accept a flat directory structure. So you end up with a bunch of files all in the same directory, which is strange. Uh, and you will end up with a lot of small files and a lot of these small files will be Go files but will actually contain C code in them uh, as comments. Uh, just like similar to how we instructed Go to, to link to the C library use, uh, passing these uh, specially formatted uh, comments before, uh, we can do the same thing and just uh, shove a bunch of C function in there and uh, that will allow the Go compiler to just uh, take everything as a single compilation unit and manage it for us. We don't need to call out to the C compiler um, manually. But we need to do uh, to compile our project into two steps. Uh, the first one is to generate a C header uh, that provides an interface to the glue code that we will build between uh, uh, C and Go. And the second step is to build the library itself because the library needs to, some parts of the library, the library, the, the bindings are implemented in C and they need to call to the glue code. And so they need to know what the interface looks like. Uh, this sounds complicated, but it's actually two commands in, in the make file. Uh, I just need to make sure that you call them in the right order and that's it. Objects still has the same limitation that uh, we talked about when we were discussing binding in the opposite direction. So the Go objects cannot be Go objects cannot be accessed directly from C. So we use the same trick: lookup table. And uh, this time, instead of just passing an integer around, which we did before because it was internal stuff, we didn't care. Uh, now we want the C API to be good, so we take this reference and we wrap it in an actual C structure so that we have some sort of type safety. So it looks like this. Um, you just have a specific um, specific structure and then you have uh, an assigned in, in, in inside it. Um, one other, another thing to be mindful of when dealing with this stuff is that uh, it's true that Go function can be made callable by C, uh, 
however, the interface that is uh, produced while doing so is not particularly good and you don't have much control over it. And like one example is that there are no const pointers. Like everything is just pointers without constants, which if for C libraries is not good enough. Uh, and so in order to have a decent C API that a C programmer <coughs> may want to use, uh, we're gonna create uh, some small C wrappers on top of the whatever is generated by Go. And since we already need these wrappers, uh, we're gonna take the chance and just put, uh, use them to, to deal with our wrapped objects uh, in a nice manner. So what it looks like is this is the glue code. So this is a Go function that is exported to C. And you know we, we do the usual stuff. It's after a while it, it just looks all the same. Uh, you you convert uh, the types. You call the actual Go function, and then you collect the result and you convert it to uh, either a value or an error, depending on what happened, and return it. Um, that's it. Uh, but we also create this this wrapper that we, I just mentioned. And so this is a better C API because it contains, uh, uh, for example, the extension is a const char because we don't need to modify it. Um, and so it's, it's a toy because this function does, we know that the function will not modify the contents of, the, of our object. And we can also deal with, um, uh, you see we, we get the go pointer out of the toy object and we also, if needed, we wrap the reference to the Go error into a C error as necessary. Uh, you see that this is inside a comment block and then there's the import C stuff at the, as, at the bottom, but it's in, inside a Go file. This is what I was uh, mentioning earlier that you can stuff entire C functions uh, as comments in a Go file and those will be compiled uh, just fine. Um, the errors are handled in the same way as when we were handling uh, uh, the C bindings for the Rust code, just identical. Uh, we still wrap them. And the callbacks are handled pretty much the same as when we were writing Go bindings for C code. The, the same tricks and the same caveats apply. So now that we have done all of this, what did we achieve? So we achieved that the client code uh, can basically not care whether it's calling out to native Rust code or a Rust binding for some C code or Rust binding for some C code calling down to some Go code. Uh, if, we, if we diff this C example uh, that we have, and these are the bindings, the C bindings calling to the Rust and the Go implementation, they are identical, there is no difference. If we diff the Rust examples, the only difference is the name of the crate is different, so the code is the same. If we diff the Go examples, the only difference is that when we are dealing with the native implementation, uh, we have garbage collection by our side, and when we are using bindings, we have to manually uh, free the objects that are bound. Uh, but everything else is identical. All the logic is identical. So from the user point of view, we can basically switch the implementation from underneath the user without the user <coughs> mostly noticing. <coughs> and conclusions. So writing a C library, um, uh, taking a C library and converting it to Rust is possible. This is probably not, not a surprise to anyone because that was one of the main design goals of Rust was to replace, uh, to be used by Firefox, right? And Firefox is written in C++, so they needed to be able to, to call Rust code from, from C and C++. So this is not very surprising. Uh, what is perhaps more surprising is that you can do the same thing with Go, which is not something that, as I said, you find a lot of documentation about. Not a lot of people seem to be doing that. But it is possible, it works. Another thing that we learned is that glue code is ugly and repetitive. Uh, it's, it's really 
not not the prettiest code. And the, the, the version you've seen is the one that removes a lot of the details. Like this is the pretty version, and it was already early. Uh, but the techniques that you learn while binding uh, one language to another can be reused when you do the opposite bindings, when you bind different languages. Once you've learned it, it's a tool in the toolbox, and it's very reusable. Um, like I have not personally tried, but if I wanted to write, uh, for example, Python mm -hmm. bindings or something like that, I assume that a lot of these techniques will still apply with some variation. Uh, and all of this code is uh, clearly, because of that, a good candidate for code generation. Now, I've done everything manually, but if you wanted to do this, like for realses, you will need to generate most of this code. You cannot write it manually, it's just too error prone. Um, but to learn, it's good to write it manually. All right, so I'm gonna thank a uh, few people slash entities. Well, Red Hat, my employer, for letting me work on this. My good friend Martin, who is not in the audience, but okay, uh, who helped me really a lot with the Rust part, and so he deserves a shout out in particular. And all the random strangers of the internet who wrote a lot of articles about this stuff, so I could just Google whenever I got stuck. Uh, otherwise, I would be not presenting this stuff. Um, we're really early. Questions? You, may, you mentioned about code generation. Which tool do you suggest for code generation? <clears throat> so the question is, what tool to use to, for code generation? And the answer is, uh, I did not get that far. What language will you use to write it? The question is, what language will you, I use to write it? Uh, code what, generation. the code generation tool? I don't know. I guess, uh, I think there are, uh, I know that at least for, for Rust there is a uh, um, C bind gen, for example, if you want to, cre uh, to create C bindings for a Rust project, that already gets you some of the way there, uh, but I haven't used it uh, in practice, and I'm sure that there are other tools that generate this kind of code. I just really haven't had time to look into it. Maybe you can find something off the shelf, maybe you will have to build it yourself, but just don't write the code manually. It's, it's not sane to do that at scale. So what do you think about debugging these kind of mixtures? So the question is about debugging. Uh, debugging is uh, surprisingly easy. At least uh, the example itself was easy, right? So when you get to more complex scenario, uh, the difficulty of debugging will increase uh, accordingly. Uh, but when you're dealing with uh, C and uh, Rust, uh, Rust is very well integrated in GDB, so you just use GDB and you get your stack traces and everything. Uh, Go is also very well integrated. The only th problem with Go comes when you have GoRoutine into the mix that requires specific uh, set of commands to be, to be used in GDB. Uh, but when I was hitting issues, um, I was just using GDB, get the stack trace, figure out where I was and uh, it, it was it was not an insane experience where like I have no idea what's going on. You you could figure out what was going on, especially if you like uh, program defensively and you put like a, a lot of uh, panics and assert when you're fed invalid data, which I think is fair. Yes. Yeah, it's GitLab. Yeah, we do free software, you know. Good luck. <laughs> Any more questions? How, how, how do you start to uh, convert a project, so to integrate to the project? You know, if you have a huge, which project are you working on, for instance? All right, so the, to the, so the, the part to the, the rest of the group. Yeah. What's the, what's the speed? So the question is, uh, where do you start if you want to convert an existing C project to a different language? Uh, I don't have practical experience in actually doing it. Uh, so my guess would be you start from the part of the project that is more self-contained. Uh, and uh, when you have like a self-contained module that does a, cert a single thing, uh, you can rewrite a single thing in uh, Rust or Go or whatever, and then provide uh, uh, a C API, an internal C API to the rest of your C code, 
and then gradually you basically tend to expand that horizon of what parts are in in uh, Rust or Go and what parts are in C, and you just move along. That would be my guess, but I haven't done it in practice. So. All right. Thank you.